All right, everyone. Hello, my name is Kate Markey. I'm a nurse here at the Life Support Learning Center at UVA Health. And today we're going to talk about the so what of normal. Our objectives, because we always have to have objectives, right, is to define what normal really is and explaining the need to trend vital signs, though we will talk about a few other things as well. So normal, what, what is normal uh, for the healthcare provider? Um, what, how do I know my patient is normal? So normal is often defined by a set of baseline numbers um, that healthcare providers should aim to maintain for their patients. So these are numbers that we find in our textbooks. These are numbers that are given to us in our order sets by our physicians. Um, so some examples, keep systolic blood pressure greater than 90, keep MAP greater than 50. A normal heart rate, so to speak, is between 60 to 100. And a normal O2 saturation is greater than 94%. However, you know, this is a really nice place to start. So I kind of have an idea of, of where I'm going, what things should be, and perhaps what things shouldn't be. So when I see that my patient's blood pressure is, you know, 70 over 30, I can go and say, hey, you know, that's that's kind of a big deviation there. I'm, I'm concerned. I should go investigate that. But we really need to be able to recognize what normal is before I can go in and make that judgment and say, yes, yeah, 70 over 30 is absolutely abnormal for this patient, right? So I need to know kind of what that patient's baseline is. Now, a patient with a heart rate of 50, technically that falls below normal, right? How we would define normal here, but that may be normal for that patient, right? Maybe that patient is a runner and they have a low resting heart rate at baseline, or maybe that patient is elderly and is beta blocked and that's where their heart rate lives because they're beta blocked. So we really need to understand what the patient's baseline is before we go on and start making judgments. Even something like your O2 saturation. My patient who has COPD may have a normal O2 saturation of 89%, and that's totally okay for them. So again, it's figuring out kind of where your patient is to begin with before we start making judgments that I need to intervene here. All right, let's look at vital signs specifically. A patient presents to you with the following. A heart rate of 60, a blood pressure of 97 over 60, sat at 96%, and a respiratory rate of 18. Is this patient okay? You worried about this patient? Well, if we go back to our vital signs that we were talking about that are technically our normals, right? That's our, our place to start. Patient falls within our parameters. That's a fabulous thing, right? So if I'm looking at just numbers alone, the patient looks okay. But really, I need to go in and assess my patient because normal is determined by so much more than that, right? It's also determined on what the vital signs were before, if you have the luxury to have them. And not all of us do. Those of us who are in pre-hospital setting or in the emergency department setting may not have these vitals to trend to start. Um, but I've definitely had this patient where their heart rate was absolutely 60 and everything you know, looked okay. Um, but five minutes before, their heart rate was 100, and I didn't do anything to change that. That is, is distressing. <laughs> when there's such a, a big difference there and you didn't do anything to kind of intervene to make that change happen. And that patient ended up coding. We ended up having to code that, that patient. So these are kind of things to think about. Where did my patient start? Is this an okay place for them to be? Let's talk about a case for the littles, for example. Okay, My patient's heart rate at one minute, maybe 70. And then, you know, an hour later, it's 80. It's 90, it's 100. I mean, they're just going up a little bit each time. If you look at this vital trend down here at the bottom of your screen. But where does it end? Because it's very plain to see, if you guys look from 12 to 4 o'clock there, that something bad is happening, right? If you look at that five-hour span. But from that hour to hour, it's not really a big change. There's not really this this big gaping difference like I just gave you with that last example where the patient's heart rate was 100 and then it was 60 a minute later, right? This is what we call a case of the littles. My heart rate is a little up. My respiratory rate is a little up. My pulse oximetry is a little down. My temperature is a little up. My blood pressure is a little lower. This is a case of, a little, of the littles. And if you see all of these littles, you see uh, trends where, oh, it's just a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and there are a lot of littles there. 
something bad is probably happening. It's probably a big. It's probably something that we really need to pay attention to. I really like this chart because it can show you that trend over time. And what I mean when I say we actually trend our patients. So I can see over time that that heart rate is going up. And that is not the direction that I want it to go in. I can see over time that my temperature is also going up. I can see over time that um, my pulse oximetry is going down or that my respiratory rate is going up. And this is what I mean by trending your patient and looking at the direction they're going in. Because with that chart there, um, whether it's the line chart or the, the formal chart down at the bottom, you can see that your patient is moving in that wrong direction. They're trending the wrong way. This is why we assess and we reassess our patients such that we have these trends and we can make that call. Because the question becomes, as the healthcare provider, where do you draw the line before you get help? Where do you draw the line before you need to intervene? Now, these are not questions that I can answer for you. This is a lot of clinical judgment here. But by looking at where your patient starts and trending, as well as taking into consideration some of the other factors we're going to talk about, you'll be able to better make that call. All right, let's talk about mental status. Your patient is alert and oriented to person, place, time, and situation. Are they good? Well, that's technically normal, right? Life should be good, but it really involves more investigative work. I'm a former neuroscience nurse, and Really, what you got to do is continue asking questions and continue assessing that patient. I have certainly had patients who have memorized the answers to those questions and had no idea why they were in the hospital. What they knew when I asked that they were scripted, right? Scripted questions come out the same way each time. So you really need to dig in to ensure that they are, in fact, oriented times four. Well, now if your patient presents to you with an altered mental status, does that automatically mean it's abnormal. It's kind of the flip side of the coin, right? Well, not necessarily. What is my patient's baseline? What are they like every day? Is my patient an Alzheimer's patient or a Dementa patient? And uh, they're just confused all the time and they can, they're oriented to a uh, person in place and that's about it? Or is this a new finding and that's why they're coming to the hospital? So you really need to continue to kind of dig in and do some investigative work. And this also kind of goes to the point of, did I do something to cause them to have altered mental status? Did I give them a medication or something that is now depressing this mental status? And we'll talk more about that momentarily. Medications, both new and old, can affect vital signs and the mentation of a patient. Right. Think about things like narcotics and benzos. These can depress a patient's level of consciousness. It can decrease their respiratory rate, and it will not look good on that trend that we talked about. So if that's the cause, you know, it's something I did is the cause, you need to assess, is it going to be a problem? And if it is, consider intervening. If it's not going to be a problem, if it's something that's expected, and they're still perfusing properly, their airway is still patent, they're still breathing okay. You know, you're thinking about those ABCs, airway breathing circulation, those things that'll kill people now, things that we like to intervene with first because they'll kill people now. If it's going to cause a problem there, then absolutely you need to consider intervention. But if it's not and it just causes a little dip, it may be okay. But again, you need to go in and look at your patient. Something else to consider is, is this medication hiding a problem? One of the big examples that comes to mind are beta blockers. Beta blockers inhibit compensatory increases in heart rate. So my patient who is in hypovolemic shock will not have that increase in heart rate that I look for when, you know, it's kind of the typical things that you look for in hypovolemic shock. I'm not going to see that vital sign change. A patient in sinus tachycardia should not be getting a beta blocker because their heart rate is too high, because sinus tachycardia is a physiologic response to something happening, whether that's me running up and down the stairs or shoveling the snow or mowing the lawn or what have you, sepsis, among other things. 
your heart rate increases and you get sinus tachycardia for a reason. You need to figure out the underlying cause and treat the underlying cause of the increase in heart rate and not just hide it because the numbers look bad. So in summary, when determining if a patient's condition is normal, consider what is the patient's medical history? Is there a change from baseline? Should I expect what I'm seeing from this patient based on their medical history? For example, that demented patient who sundowns, right? Should I expect that person to become confused later on in the evening? What is the vital trend? Is it moving in the right direction? Right? I'll be able to see if my patient's vital signs are, are improving or are staying the same, or if they show signs of subtle signs sometimes, that patient is deteriorating. Did I do something to affect it? Or is there something hiding a problem? And this is medications new and old. Is this, is this change in my vitals trends, this change in how my patient is mentating, something I can expect because I just gave them a dose of um, some narcotics, such as morphine, right? Or is this something kind of out of the blue that's happening and we need to go and intervene? Or are we giving the patient something and it's hiding a problem, such as your beta blockers? So this will all help kind of point in, in the direction of, is my patient deteriorating? Should I intervene? When do I make that call? And then we always think about who should I call when I, I need to intervene or I need some help. Call in all the king's horses and all the king's men. Call your medical control. Um, call for backup. Call your other nurses. Whomever that looks like. These are all things that we need to think about. Because by being prepared for the worst and expecting the worst and looking for the worst, one, we'll be able to find it. And two, we'll be able to better intervene with our patients and intervene earlier, which will give us better outcomes. I'd like to thank you for joining me today. I hope you'll come back soon. <laughs>